Okay, we've come to our third segment with Smyrna, and uh, we'll be maybe a shorter lesson tonight. So we let's begin with prayer, and we'll get started. Loving Father, thank you for your mercies and grace to us. Uh, another week, we pray for your blessing. Uh, even though our numbers are fewer, we ask for your spirit to guide and lead us into all truth and give us the wisdom that we need as we study this short but very important uh, church in the segment of churches, Revelation 2 and 3. We give you all the praise. We thank you for your cleansing blood in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. So we're looking at verse 10. Just a quick recap. Last week, 8 and 9. I think the main theme is persecution with Smyrna. And we saw how the members were encouraged to be faithful unto death because of just the persecution. Then we'll get more into that for this evening segment. But Polycarp, 168 AD, burned at the stake, apparently survived, and then so they had to uh, uh, put like a sword or something in him to bring his death about. But there were others, and um, it was a difficult time, those the 200 years um, the, during the Smyrna age. We also looked at in the prior segment how many times Smyrna seemed to come back from the dead, earthquakes or um, in the 14th century, the Turkish army came in and they would always seem to come back to life. But as we saw and discussed last week, Smyrna means sweet-smelling uh, savor, mm -hmm. uh, like myrrh. And, you know, I think God has done that especially for Smyrna because he knew they would go through probably the most of all the churches, the most severe persecution, as we will see getting into tonight's segment. It was the heir of martyrdom, Justin Martyr. wonder if that's where they got the name, or he got the name, with six other Christians, scourged and beheaded in 165. And then in 202, there were more put to death, severe persecutions in 258. Victorianus in 304, under the martyrdoms of Diocletian. We'll be looking at that a little bit more this evening. And so we have this picture of the church of myrrh and bitterness was agreeable and precious to Christ. Though it were persecuted unto death, the very crushings released the fragrance of love and grace and patient endurance that is so precious in the sight of the master. We also looked at Smyrna needing they were rich in faith because the Lord had said, I know thy works, tribulations, but thou art rich in poverty. They were definitely poor in this world's goods, materially impoverished, but spiritually they were rich. Unlike the last church as we looked at, it was spiritually poor, but materially rich the age we're living in there was there's a psalm if you want to write this down psalm 66 10 through 12 the psalm is beautifully sets forth the beneficial results of divinely permitted trials for thou O god has proved us thou has tried us as silver is tried thou broughtest us into the net the latest affliction upon our loins thou has caused men to ride over our heads we went through fire and through water 
not just Isaiah speaks about that, but David did. But thou brought us into, thou brought us, us into or out into a wealthy place. Here is the secret of spiritual experience that leads out of the barren desert into a spiritual oasis. Of course, that's taken from Peter Bunch's book, page 138. <clears throat> and so now we come to the synagogue of Satan, and we did touch on that last week. My wife had brought something up. And we'll look at this more in Pergamos and Thyatira. But we have the synagogue of Satan in verse 9. Then we have Satan's seat in verse 13, which we'll see in the Pergamos church. And the depths of Satan in verse 24. It's like, so it's a continual movement uh, down. As the uh, a progressive downward trend both breath or breath and width as our world was moving quickly through these churches into the dark ages but we'll, we'll, we'll look at that again when we come to those churches i just wanted to recap on that okay so we come to verse 10 Let's look at that. Fear none of those things, Jesus tells Smyrna. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee crown of life. And maybe we even might get to 11. He that is had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay, what did, uh, ladies, what did you find out from looking at these two verses that you didn't know before? Anything new? The verses from. 10, and 10 through 11 yeah. or, or on 10. Of course, the first part had a lot. Um, I went through, saw a lot of the verses for suffering, mm -hmm. you know. So there's, I got like, th there were like three good verses. J well, of course, we did that one last week, the James oh. 1, 2 through 4, and um, Romans 5, 3 through 5. Of course, and some of these are repeats, but it's just on the suffering of what they went through. But the thing that I, um, the thing that was really interesting to me, because it, it's kind of like you said, um, I don't want to say it's like repeat, but you know, it's t um, kind of self explanatory. Right. But the one, the part that got me was the 10 days. 10 days. Yeah. So I looked that up. I looked that that up on the 10 days what's that number what is it number First number 10. 10 number 10 anyway and it says because I always kind of wondered about that you know tribulation for 10 days so of course it, it goes back to what I was reading it goes it goes back to um, AD 303 and 313 during that time that they were being persecuted during that time. Correct. Because it's 10, it's 10 years is what it is. The right. ten, it's, the, it's the 10 day principle. I mean, the day for a year principle. Day year principle. Yeah. So it's 10. What I found out was really interesting. So this, I mean, I, for me, it, it was, was, is that, um, oh, and the, the emperor during that time was Diocletian. And then it went to, Gallerus, I guess he was his successor. But anyway, so what I what what the thing that caught me was it said. So, so I'm thinking, how can that be like? How can you use that for our current situation? You know, because what we're trying to find all this 
like, you know, how can apply to us now. Right. So that 10 years, they said, in two of the commentaries I read, said that it was a, an annihilation of the Christians or Christianity. They only wanted the Roman influence. So it was an annihilation. They wanted to do away. They burned their books. They burned their Bibles. And then that actually led to worse, where they began to persecute. And, you know, it got worse. It, you know, first they just took their Bibles away. Then all their books, they burned them. And then it got worse and worse. So I'm thinking, that's like what's happening right now. Because what's happening right now is everything in the world that's going on with like the transgender and um oh man there's so much the race theory just like all these different things that are hitting us right now it's like they're really trying to do away with christianity uh ai right they want to be god they want to create they're going to create because you know god didn't do a good enough job so they got to create all this stuff has to do with pushing God out of the equation as much as they can. And they have been really, um, it, which is, this is, I think it's a Hegelian dialectic myself, but they're, they're really focusing a lot like on the Catholic church, a lot of the Catholic church of people who are trying to stand up more than we are stand up for against this transgender or abortion right look at how they're trying to push these other laws in to kill the babies and so you get all of these things and like i said uh, there's a lot of catholics that are being i'm talking here in the united states that are being um really targeted targeted yeah and so so you look at that this is like i said for me because i've been i've been seeing this you know just society in itself it's like pushing god out like they want god and when i read burning books i thought well that's interesting because they're trying to bring in more race uh, uh crt you know this critical race theory into the schools and the perversion to the young kids at two years old and what they're showing them that they can read in these books in the libraries. So you're looking at all this and I think it's like annihilation of the Christian faith faith, and, and, and trying to become more worldly. You know, we're trying to you know, like Sodom. And then you brought in hun that really good point because we got talking about this and I thought, isn't that weird how so Smyrna they're pushing God out. You know, they want just the Roman influence. And then you said, and then what happens at the next church? That's Constantine. And what happens? They want everybody to be Christians. They don't care if you're pagan or not. Everybody, you know, gets, you know, you know, there's no persecution that goes on. It, this isn't the next church, right? So I'm thinking, so that means that if that's the case, and we're following that order. Yeah, we're following that. That means that whoever comes in next, whoever it is, I, I don't whoever it is, comes in next as president or whatever, right? They're gonna really focus. They're gonna they're gonna swing the pendulum way over here for Christianity. And that's where the Sunday laws will come in. Well, yeah, and as my wife mentioned, we have talked about this, and I've held the position that Scripture supports that theme, not only based on history, what we're reading about here with his, uh, the historical uh, nature of the churches, but Daniel 11, with the king of the south, king of the north, gives this impression. The Hegelian dialectic is certainly in play because we, we just to deviate slightly from the topic, the definition of Babylon, we all know, means confusion. There is a lot of confusion in our world today. People don't know what's up, what's down, what's right, what's left. Yeah, what's wrong is right. What's wrong is right. I, I looked, if you want to look up the text, it's biblical, oh, Isaiah 520. They will call right 
uh, evil, good, and good, evil. I think that's verbatim what it says. And we're living in that time. Mm -hmm. So the devil's pushing the needle in every way he can to, as Mary said, destroy Christianity, like we see under the Smyrna case, the Smyrna era. And uh, I don't know if any of you did research. I did not know that there were apparently 10 Roman emperors that were more pronounced in their enmity against Christianity during that 200-year period than the, than the others. And they, at least in, um, what's his name, book. There's 10, did. there was 10 what now? 10 Roman emperors during mm -hmm. the Ephesus and Smyrna period, mm. periods that persecuted Christians. They were more pronounced in their enmity against persecution, against Christians. And he lists them. We seem to only really know, and I don't know why these two names stick out, but the others, I don't know if I've ever read this before. Nero, who took Paul's head off, so he's back way back there in, you know, the Ephesian period when the church was going forth as um, conquering and to conquer on that white horse. But then there's Dom Domitian. Yeah. Which was John thrown into the pot of oil, tradition says, under his reign. And then after he's gone, then there's Trajan, Hadrian, Severus, Maximinius. If you want to write all these down, I can. Well, see. wait a minute. Where's Where's Diocletian fit in? He's coming up. Okay, you have. You're talking from. Okay. This is just the list from Nero all the way to Diocletian is the last. And I think his successor, though, said is that. Galerius. Yeah, see, and he does it. He's number eleven. They're just giving ten during from Nero to Diocletian, and Diocletian, as I'm going to read some things, was the worst of them all. Yeah, you think Nero was bad, and maybe that. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but this could be why under Diocletian these ten. And, and so don't. these ten, you're saying these ten emperors are from Ephesus to. Yeah, during the Ephesus period under Nero. Yeah. The false head off, so that's like 65, 66 yeah. AD, all the way down until probably three, what, 302, three to 313. So we're looking at a two. Oh, so in that 10 year period, you're saying, yeah. Is that what you're saying? No, Diocletian was the 10 year period. Correct. That's why I'm getting but confused. The 10, the 10 emperors were for more than 200 years. Okay. Of, and there were more than that, but these were the worst of all the emperors during that 200 and so what does that span through period. though that's what i'm trying to get so does that span from ephesus to yes. the end ephesus of the and smyrna period just the ephesus and smyrna period okay so and if you want the list i can go over I, you know uh, and then there's valerian Aurelian, and Diocletian, the last three and the reason for this as the Pontifex Maximix, Mas, Maximus, and we know who borrowed that term, of the religion of the state, the emperor was the protector of the Roman gods. It was therefore his duty to guard the religion of the empire against the inroads of other systems. So that's partly, see, Christianity was an attack on all the heathen gods. Old Testament times, and, you know, from about the time of um, King Saul, the last, you know, well, even we can go back to Gideon. Well, no, Gideon was, uh, was Gideon in the time of Joshua, after Joshua? I think so. So, uh, but it was kind of up and down. We get to King Saul, and he really pushed back against the Philistines, but David really wiped them out, most of them. I mean, for, I don't know, 100, 200 years, Solomon was the realm of peace. And then you get the kings, and there's a good king. Well, Solomon was, went downhill. He, you know, he recovered. His son really went off the ropes, Jeroboam, and that's, or Rehoboam. And so Jeroboam came up and developed 
calf worship in Samaria, and things went down further. Within, I think, a hundred years, not even a hundred years, that was probably maybe just a dozen years. It, it wasn't very long at all. The Lord had to split the ten kingdoms, or the twelve, the ten to the north, and Judah and and um, Benjamin. Benjamin. What's that? Yeah, she was saying. I just said so, and and so you have good king, bad king, and then a couple bad kings and a good king. And it's you know, Joash was good, has a guy for the most part, Jehoshaphat for the next three hundred years, until finally Nebuchadnezzar, uh, God says, "Enough with you." Under Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes him all to Babylon. Assyria did that too, one hundred and fifty years before to the ten northern tribes took them into captivity so israel never really recovered after the time of david and and solomon but god wiped out in time of joshua you know leaving after moses died he wiped he, they not fully it took till the time of david but many of the tribes that he you know the hittites the canaanites the amorites all of these heathen tribes he wipes out once they're in canaan but not completely. But we get to New Testament time, God doesn't work that way anymore because we're not under theocracy. Christianity is not going to the world. And the persecutions really begin in the time of Paul, the apostles. Nero, as I listed, all these emperors, all the way to Diocletian. And as my wife brought up, if this is true, this order holds true, whoever our next president is going to be and the pushback in our government against what is happening during this regime, we could see, and we'll look at this more fully when we come back after the break with Pergamus, that there is, that you have the Council of Milan, which is a coming together church and state. This may be coming about, uh, you know, in our, in the next couple of years. And I had been thinking more and more along these lines because there's enough Christianity element in our country that they are not going to put up with this. What's happening, as my wife mentioned, all these things, overrunning the border, AI, CRT, all this woke ideology, transgender garbage. Christianity is not going to put up with this too much longer because there's an element, a Roman element in Christianity called Catholicism. Hmm. And the fires of persecution will once again be rekindled. But before we get to that point, then there's a change of the guard. Laws will begin to be put in place just like under Constantine's time. So we shall see if that holds true in our day. Well, Billy Graham's son just said, Franklin Graham just said, it's uh, all hell is being let loose right now in the Christians. And he said, we have to fight back. So uh, <laughs> you hear things like this and oops, I wonder, you know, things slip out now and then from some of these Christian leaders. So you know, once they're back in positions of power, could be the time of Constantine again, um, where there's going to be coming. Because really, if you think about it, the only way that you stop all of this evil from spreading, from a government perspective, you pass laws. So that if you get out of line, there's consequences to your criminal behavior. Boom, you go to prison. Um, that will really change the flavor of what's happening in our country. But the like, like Mary said, the the pendulum is going to swing so far to the right. It could it could be a repeat of what we saw under Constantine. Well, a lot of them believe the pro these evangelicals believe that church and state should be united. That's true too. Nationalists, right? Right, right. So they believe that. <laughs> that they should be not separate, but they should be together. 
So, so God's people today, as we now look at the application, we, we move into that realm. Well, but let, before we get there, I would just want to mention this 10 days. The 10 days of trial mentioned in the Smyrna letter represent a period that would test God's people mm -hmm. to the limit of their endurance, both in severity and duration. Christians were to pass through a complete baptism of suffering. And I kind of thought about the time of trouble for God's people. And it will certainly be a baptism of suffering during that time. So it's not necessarily that it's going to be an, a, a, a literal 10 years. It's just that it that's what's taking place is what happened in that 10-year period. It, it, correct. It yeah. Okay. And it, I never said, well, I did reference it. The last and most bloody of these 10 persecutions took place under Diocletian. And probably Fox's Book of Martyrs is one of the better sources if you really wanted to find out. You know, it could have been when they were being thrown to the Coliseum, you know, and the Christians were all sporting events. You get 40, 50,000 people. And I mean, they're just bloodthirsty to see these Christians ripped apart. We haven't yet gotten to that point in our world. That's pretty gruesome. You have, they have though, if you think about it, yeah, we have, because even if it, if it's not always, look at all, look at the animal fights that they put on. Well, animal fights, we're right? getting close to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or the abuse that they do to some of the animals or even people. Yeah. May well in other countries. Well, here we're talking um, about we're talking in the united states you know you just go to chicago and you'll see some yeah you know that they are really that they like to see pain inflicted violence. on other people yeah yeah that's true that is that that's the spirit of, of inflicting yeah. pain but under this baptism of suffering and martyrdom with the assurance of the fullness of christ's love and sympathy he gave the promise if you endure to the end crown of life is given so let's uh, is there any thoughts ladies you better dan on anything you may have uncovered on this that you'd like to share actually i do i wanted i just i was reading this uh, revelation book and it was talking on 32, no, 34. And it says, we need to experience now. It's talking about the applications of today. Okay. And it says, we are not facing any trials or persecution in our lives today. We must ask ourselves if we're really living a godly life. It says, we need to experience now that will prepare us for that time. The Church of Smyrna is a shining example for us to follow in times of persecution. If they were alive at the end of the world, they would pass through the time of trouble with flying colors. Can we say the same of ourselves? Do we love Jesus as much and not even the threat of death can shake our faithfulness to him? Revelation 12, 11 promises that there will be a group of people at the end of time who will be faithful unto death. May we be among that number. And I thought that was really, um, that whole application thing was was something that was really good to put my put in my mind and i'm going to try to keep that in my mind because you know we need to be experiencing that now sorry i've got my washing machine going no Is no it, problem uh, you don't hear uh, oh, go ahead you no i was just saying i don't hear your washing machine oh okay just a little pushback on what that author said dan god has different ways even if there's not raw persecution in America today or first world countries like we're reading about with Smyrna, he has different ways to bring his people through trials. He squeezes, as my wife and I, we feel like we've really gone through the last couple of months. Trials, obviously, involving finances could be one. Um, some people go through health issues. We've been there as well. Divorce, 
a breakup of homes, it's another major trial. We wouldn't think of it, but it could be. These are, you know, uh, there's, well, there's one lady we're going to talk about here uh, that we've mentioned in the past. She went through a severe divorce a few years ago. And you don't really recover from, you know, especially if it's severe. You know, we've all known people that that has happened to. So that could be a form of persecution. Sure. There's certainly persecution going on in other countries. As I mentioned last week, um, somebody, it, it was either Cynthia or Elena said that there, earlier this month, there were 35 churches burned in India. And I'm sure there's things going on all the time in different countries of the world. While persecution, it, on the level of what's happening happened in Smyrna. But we know that the time is coming, as we were just referencing, that if we're having a change in the guard and the pendulum's going to swing, we know where this is going to go. Because we have the prophetic roadmap. The danger is most of our people today, it, it, generally in Christianity, but specifically for our, for the remnant people, they're not preparing. I'm not saying there aren't some, or a, there's always a few in every age, but the majority, they're not preparing. And I think that's what this author was trying to get at. It's just that. And you could be if, right. If you're not going through trials, I don't right. think necessarily meant, you know, you're having to be burned at the stake. Okay. But but if it's, he says, if you're, if you're not going through these trials, there's a problem. Are you living a God? Yeah. Life? And are you, so if you, if you're not having this pushback, then you're not really standing out to living that godly life. And of course, I think that's why he was saying, then he brought in, of course, Smyrna that, you know, they would have just flown through this because that was their beeline was right at not wavering at all, you know, and um, I mean, that's at least how I took it. That he well, wasn't okay. necessarily he could, made, but he would just say I'll, trials in general. If I'll you're grant not, you that. Yeah, you're there's there's a problem and there is Satan's not going to bug you if you're not really bothering him. Right. Yep. So I think that's kind of what he was trying to, and that he said, you know, are you, you know, bottom line. Mm -hmm. So you could just put that in, I think any a circumstance, right? So are you willing, are you willing to put your life on the line, even with family standing up against family, right? Let's say that's a really important part in your life. Are you willing to do that for Jesus? Are you willing to say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go do that. Or I'm no, I'm not going to be involved with that. Even if I love you guys, you know, whatever, are you, whatever it is, are you willing to take a put stand yourself on the line like that for yeah. him? I think that's what he was trying to. Well, and, and since you brought it up, hon, families are probably going to be the most severe. Yeah. If you, if we take circle within a circle, within a circle, you've got We've all heard the phrase, blood runs thicker than water. <laughs> hmm. And there's a lot of truth to that. But outside the blood ties, then you have church family. For some, that's going to be a trial. When you have to take a stand against your church because they are not following the principles that you have conviction on in the scripture, and you will, you will be... Um, basically I, uh, isolated or ostr ostracized. That's going to be tough for some people. Uh, we're talking with a lady right now, Mary's consulting with because she's going through cancer uh, in the Red Bluff Church. Her husband's gone to Florida, bought a home there, and she doesn't feel like she has anybody. So she calls Mary a couple times a week and just, help! Because she doesn't have really anybody. And so you these these individuals are going to have it very difficult when the crisis really hits. So you'll have that circle of influence. 
And then, of course, the wider circle from society will have to deal the Christian world first and then the broader spectrum of society. So we're, we're going to be confronted with all these things. And what we're right now, as you were saying, Hunt, we see all this, this pushback and really raw persecution from the atheistic side of our world to destroy Christianity. And we see that or to destroy the principles of what this nation, especially in America, has stood for, the Judeo-Christian principles. And we're looking at this in a, it's a slow motion train wreck the last few years. And it's, it, we're having to accept what is actually happening because it is. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a swelling up in our hearts and, and breasts to say, this is not just. And of course, we know we have two tier system of justice in our world. And there needs to be a bringing back to some equity. Well, equity can't even use that word because it's used wrong, but some balance in our world. And what it, you have to change the government apparatus in order for that to occur. Otherwise, this thing is going to eventually we're going to become like a third world banana republic. But the prophetic map of Revelation 13 and 17, this nation leads the way. So we knew we're getting close and there's going to be a change. OK, Yvette, did you have anything you wanted to share? No. Well, I guess I'm I'm a little bit confused because I've I read this thing on Smyrna in the period of suffering and martyrdom. Um and in the state religion. So is that what we're talking about? Is that the when the state religion steps in, then there's going to be this persecution? Well, when it talked about the state religion, that was under the Roman emperors, those first two, two, three centuries. Raw persecution, in other words, you have these Roman, I mean, we all know what Nero did, blaming the Christians for burning down the city of Rome. I mean, you think, you, really? But that's how bad things were. No, these are pagan emperors. Before it came into the, to the religious realm, th that's going to happen under the church pergamus. They're going to unite under Constantine. This is still raw. What we see in our country today is unless there's going to be a turnaround, it's the atheistic element. I'm listening to a great controversy uh, I started a few days ago on the French Revolution. It's a repeat of what we're seeing today. It just hasn't been fully developed like it was in France. But they threw out God in France. Our nation is basically doing that at its highest levels by their, their laws and regulation. They're doing away with all law. You can't have a lawless society, but that's, and they're turning, you know, just a few years ago, our government agencies were focused on protecting this country. Now they've turned on the citizens of this country. And, and we all know the statement, more to fear from within than without. Well, that's what's happening to America. It's disintegrating from the inside. Because moral principles are thrown out. And there's no consequence for wrongdoing. I mean, we all know what's happened here in the last few years. People would go into these department stores and they'd just run off with whatever they wanted. And no, but there's no consequence. You don't go arrest them. You just, it's like mob rule. And you can't have a society like that. And so we see, and of course, France went to the extreme and and they started killing people, you know, and um, anything with a religious flavor, Catholic, Protestants, they took them out and they just cut them up. I mean, it was, and we know this is where things will go unless you have a change. So the goal during that time was to, like we were saying, to annihilate Christianity. Annihilate Christianity. Christianity That's the devil's goal. Which is what's happening right now. It won't be until we go into the next church that now church and state will combine unite together. The next church, which is Pergamos. And there's, 
again, the prophetic picture, and the devil knows this. He knows if I can push the envelope, push society to, you know, because he knows he's not going to destroy the religious element in this nation. But if he can push them to the point where they said, we've had enough. And once we have a change of the guard, we're going to see religious laws, because that's what the book Great Converse, that's what Revelation 13 says. This nation, which is already speaking as a dragon on the political side, that will swing into the religious element, and that's where we have to fear. I mean, we should be concerned even over here as we see our freedoms going. But we know where it's going to end up. It's going to end up on the religious side, and you know who the target's going to be. Not the Christians in this country who are Sunday keepers, but those who don't go along with that law are going to be the target. That's not going to happen under this uh, time period that we're living presently, under this government, because their goal is to destroy Christianity, not to make a law that you need to go to church on that day. But that's what the prophetic picture says will happen. So we have to see a, the pendulum swinging. And that could very well happen in the next after the next presidential election. But we don't know how bad things are going to get between now and then that will bring about that change very quickly. It could. Constantine was very, he shows up on the scene and he says, we need to stop this. No more persecution of Christians. And he had this dream or whatever when they went to battle one day and he, the impression or what he saw in vision was conquer in the sign of the cross. And so he used the religious element. We're not going to persecute Christians anymore. And so we know where this, and then the first Sunday law came out, 321 AD. And we'll be looking at that more fully under Pergamos. But the last little bit, the last verse, we must finish up now. That last verse, he that hath an ear, once again, with all seven, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The reward is for those upon whom the enemy inflicts his worst tortures, ending even in death itself. The recompense for faithfulness, even under the martyrdom, is a crown of life. Elsewhere, Christians are promised a crown of glory, a crown of righteousness, a crown of rejoicing. This is all referring to the same thing. The blood of the martyrs was seed that produced a bountiful harvest of souls. And so the lampstand of the church of Smyrna was not removed. It is the only church of the seven that exists today. And is still letting its gospel light shine. Because they survived under the worst form of persecution, torture, and death. None of the other churches have survived under them at least in, in the natural. Smyrna has been known to the Turks as infidel Smyrna because of their inability to destroy the local church, nor were the emperors of pagan Rome able to extinguish the light through the agency of persecution. Smyrna and Philadelphia are the only two of the seven churches that received no reproof. I wonder why. We'll, get, we'll look at Philadelphia when we get there, but Smyrna didn't need any reproof because their head was on the chopping block, so to speak, or they were being right. persecuted even unto death. And, you know, it's, it's not surprising that all 12, after Judas, and they replaced him with, I think his name was Malchemus or whatever his name, all 12 except for John of the disciples suffered a martyr's death. I think we're going to see great persecution even unto death in this generation. It's not the most enjoyable church to read about, but it is part of our history. Was that Smyrna? Smyrna. Okay. Absolutely. 
It's part of our history. The fires of persecution have purified the church and much of the lost love and works have been regained. Could that even have been under Ephesus? That as we went into the Smyrna period, the same thing happened with Ephesus before their light totally went out. For a time, they their love and works were regained. Tribulation will also play an important part in the purification of the remnant of the church in preparation for translation. These are they, and he finishes at least this chapter, that, which came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Any last minute thoughts before we close out the segment, ladies? Well, just one quick question. So there's a section down here that says the Church of Satan. Um, are they comparing this with the Church of Smyrna? Or is that a Church of Satan that comes up through the Smyrna? Are you talking about the synagogue of Satan? Yeah, yeah well, the, the subtitle says Church of Satan on page 138. Talking about those. Yeah, those that, he's talking about the synagogue of Satan there. Okay, I see it. I see it. Um, he spent some time discussing what a Jew is. Uh, the term could have been used as Israel, you know, seed of Abraham when Israel, Jacob wrestled an angel. Christ changed his name to Israel. Um, he, he talks about false members. The false brethren were not really members of the Church of Christ, even though their names were enrolled on the church records. The term synagogue of Satan, we talked about this a little bit last week. Synagogue and church are virtually synonymous. Terms meaning congregation or assembly. Ancient Israel is called the church in the wilderness, Acts 7.38, and the synagogue of the Lord in the Old Testament scriptures. The Christian church is called a synagogue in the marginal reading of James 2.2. 2. Satan, the great deceiver and imitator, has a church or synagogue which God designates as Babylon. And I think in every church age, there has been that element Satan has in each of the seven churches, those who are serving him, though their names are on the books of the church. Because I heard it said years ago by a pastor, if you want to be a good devil, if there is such a term, you would put on church clothes and join the church and sit on the front row of the church. But your behavior during the week, you'd act like a devil. And that would, you know, that's how the devil operates. Wolf in sheep's clothing. Do you have something to say, Dan? No? Oh. So did that help a little bit, Yvette? With that yeah. Yeah. Because I, there's just one more thing, too. It says there are but two churches. And they are rivals. So basically, there's all these different denominations we have. They still are 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 preaching Christ. So is, is that what that means? It's like there's really no, not that there's no difference in the denominations, but well, um, they're for Christ. I didn't this, get that. There are only there are but two churches. Yeah. If you, well, I think what what they were referring to is is uh, the two churches in Revelation. You have oh, okay. the pure church and then the harlot. But really, okay. all the churches in the in Christianity today, the whole Christian world as an organization, they're all in a fallen state. They were fallen in 1844 when they kicked out those who were preaching the second coming. And they have been continuing, they're accumulating their corrupt natures, if you would, can use the term, the last 200 years or 180 years. Because they're, they're, they don't have pure doctrine. Only our church has a pure doctrine. But we don't have people who are living the truths of God's word. 
And so under the final crisis, there's only going to be two churches. Those that keep the commandments of God through the faith of Jesus and those who don't. Even this church are going to cave to the pressures of the evangelical world and certainly the government law. And all the churches so the will church eventually of become the church part. Of Christ. I'm sorry? Okay. Yeah, so the church of Satan and then the church of Christ. Yeah. And it's going to be the persecution in our day and age that purifies the, our church and those in these other churches who hear the loud cry going forth if they have anything in their heart that is responding to truth, I'm going to follow these people. They have truth. And they will be basically, you know, cast out of their churches, including Catholicism. And we'll see a great separating out of the mother church and the daughter churches. And even our own church is going to get probably, we're going to have to go into home status churches for a time before the end. Because we won't be able to worship, I don't think, in our Seventh Heavens churches, unless there are elders and a pastor that says, "No, we're following God's word." Until they come and lock the conference, comes and locks the the church door, we're worshiping here every Sabbath. Well, we've already seen that happen with COVID, and so, we've seen that uh, they kind of run up with COVID. That, they flunked that test. So, but there were some. There were a, full, a few. A few churches, ten percent. I'm going to say that kept open. Right. We will see how that all weeds out. We haven't gotten to that point, but I think that's that's the way it's going to be. But God will have a people who will keep the commandments of God in His faith, and the the message is going to spread. Not yes, it's going to be by His people, but I think it's. There's some passages in the minor prophets that say they will come into the message and they will. What have you people been doing with this message? We need to give it to the world and they will take it and run with the ball more than we have done in the past. And young people, as we get older, we don't have the energy or endurance we had when we were young. Young people will do the same. And we're told that there will be doors that will shut to adults that 9, 10, 11 year olds will preach the message in various countries. Even maybe younger. The Spirit will come upon these young children and they'll preach the message and they'll be allowed to do it because there's no laws against children preaching where adults won't be permitted to enter into those fields. She, she says that. So God will use means and ways we haven't seen yet for this message to get out there. One way or the other. The devil will not be able to stop it. The whole earth, Revelation 18.1, the whole earth's going to be lighted with his glory. Like we have never seen before. The closest we came to this, well, she says the 1840 movement was the closest since Pentecost. But when this message goes forth under the loud cry, you've got international Sunday law in place, but the message will not be stopped. God will hold back the powers of darkness until that message goes forth. There will be persecution, but it will be limited until the message goes forth to the whole world. So that synagogue of Satan just basically means that there's going to be those within the church that are playing church, that they're really not converted. Correct. In our churches. As well as all the churches. But, you know, there are other churches that are falling. Seventh Avenue Church is not falling. We've got apost we have apostasy ripe, but the church is still God's remnant people until we get to the final crisis. So hopefully that sheds some light for you on that event. Okay, let me close out our video. We will resume next time as we move into the church of Pergamos. And God will continue to lead and guide us.